Um, so today I'm going to be talking about Killing Giants. Uh, this is a talk I originally done over at Brighton SEO. So there's some links in there, embarrassingly, that say slash Brighton, but in your head just be like, it's slash Cambridge, because I actually care way more about Cambridge. So um, I'm going to take you back to 1994, where I was five years old. Um, and I was sitting with my grandfather, and he brings me the local paper. Uh, not to tell me about what was happening in the news or to perhaps teach me how to read. It was actually to place a bet in the Grand National, because um, that's what you do when you're five years old and you're in Glasgow. Um, so everyone in the family was doing it. I thought it would be a bit of fun. So I got a pound. I could just pick anyone in there. So I picked this guy, because uh, I thought you know, the, the top looked kind of cool. But um, the problem with that particular horse in the Grand National was the odds were 16 to 1, which has anyone ever bet in the Grand National out of interest? I was like, no, we're, we're far too good for that. Um, yeah, so a lot of people bet in the Grand National. Uh, 16 to 1, terrible odds. Uh, the conditions were known as heavy, which means like damp, sodden ground. The horse that I was betting on had no track record whatsoever. And actually, it was more of a kind of runt of the litter rather than anything else. Um, my family like, no, don't bet on that. Bet for the favourite or something. Anyway, I took my pound and I bet on that guy and I actually won. So if you can actually fact check, I mean, that's mini Homa from the 1994 Grand National. And that kind of got me into this idea of loving the underdog and can I skip forward kind of 30 years I want to tell you why I think I'm kind of best place to talk to you about kind of these killing giant concepts um, it's because I come from a uh, publicist group beforehand so publicist group is a kind of big networked uh, kind of digital marketing agency with people like Sachi and Sachi and Digitas LPI and Razor Fish and all that good stuff um, and I worked on some really big clients like uh, Boots and TripAdvisor and Etihad Airways, which had a lot of fun understanding like big global campaigns under kind of multiple languages and lots of kind of very difficult problems that those, those guys had in order to affect change when it came to organic search. Um, but I started in much more humble beginnings. So that second bullet point, um, I, my first website was something called Bye Bye Mama, which I started when I was a student which is essentially um, an affiliate site to help uh, students move into halls for the first time where I'd sell them like IKEA furniture and things like that. Um, I made a bit of money out of that. Then I started to move on to things like credit cards. I was getting a bit more serious because I was like, oh, you make some money at this SEO thing. And then I went really serious and I went into kind of payday loans, which if anyone's in, just as a show of hands, like agency, in-house freelancers, agency people and agency people. <laughs> to, okay, it's enemy, I'm joking, um, freelancers, okay, and in-house people slash business owners, okay, interesting, so um, I started these sites, and one of them you'll see at the bottom is called Asian Cam, uh, Asian Cam was a personal blog of an Asian gentleman called Cameron, who was studying at St Andrews University, um, which I used to get links from St Andrews University, and also Cambridge University, and built up his kind of personal profile, it's a fake person by the way. And I flipped that onto something called Live Jasmine, which is a uh, adult cams website, which um, has lifetime commissions. So, like, understanding kind of high-end kind of SEO, look, dealing with blue chips, all the way down to like the kind of CD underbelly of SEO. I feel like I've had quite an interesting kind of upbringing. I've cut my teeth in, in some kind of interesting websites, so I feel like I've got some relative authority to, to let you know how to kill giants like Boots and TripAdvisor in the SERP. So, the secret. Sadly, it's not a silver bullet. It's essentially do the exact same thing, but do it way, way faster. And what I'm going to do, um, I'm going to try and go through it. In the interest of speed, I'm going to go through it relatively quickly because there's quite a bit to go through. So I polled all of my peers on Twitter and I said, guys, how long does it take for you to do a technical audit usually, a technical SEO audit? Um, is it like an hour, a day, a week, a month? And most people said between one week and one month. I'm like, OK. And this is when I say week, I mean like, from Monday to Friday, that's five full days. And if you're charging as an agency 600 pounds a day, you're charging people three grand. If it's a month, then it's mul multiples of four. So a lot of money and a lot of time. I'm like, OK, so there's the results. Um, how long does it actually take to implement this stuff? So like we've just ran the tech audit, and the client's very happy, and you've given them 200 points of things to change. How long does it take to get it to change? And the answer was 100% of them said, I'm still waiting, um, which tends to suggest that doing that level of SEO means that we do a lot of auditing, we do a lot of research, but implementation is something that is incredibly slow. And a lot of these people work for kind of big blue chip agencies. So that's a very common thing uh, in that world. The best response was this from this guy, Kushal, who said, in my part of the world, your poll options should not include anything less than one month. And I'm like, in your part of the world? This is the best bit of this entire talk. Slovakia? 
Wait. Oslo. <laughs> Minnesota. That, uh, personally, I think that one was the best. Anyway, so moving on. Um, so Elon Musk said, each person within an operation is a vector that exerts energy to achieve a goal. Everyone has a quantity of both magnitude and direction, and a company's progress is determined by the sum of all these vectors. So in other words, get your finger out and please do some work. So you'd be very surprised actually how little work everyone actually does. So at our agency, we're really, really obsessed with not per perhaps productivity, but actually the effectiveness of doing something and the speed in which you can implement it. So we use something called rescue time in all of uh, our people's machines, which essentially what it does is it just manages the amount of time that you're actually spending on tasks. So I do about a 60 hour work week, pretty standard stuff for, for anyone who runs a business. Um, but actually, according to rescue time, I actually only do 140 hours. So that's 100 hours of just messing about and wasting time. So I started to get into that thing, well, why, why is that happening? I started thinking of things to block it out. So I got some Bose QC35 noise cancelling headphones, which are very posh and very opulent, all the rest of it. Got them for the entire business, and this happened. So rescue time tracks productive time. So productive time is things like time spent inside spreadsheets, doing actual output deliverable work. And it pretty much doubled through the entire agency. So quick hack to get your uh, staff to do more, just cancel all the noise out their heads and, and, and give them some headphones. Um, Slack, which is an instant messaging service we use to communicate with each other, the chatter pre-headphones was on the way up and post-headphones massively went on the way down. So when it comes to implementing this stuff, we're not just doing it because it's nice, we're doing it because it actually works and it's actually effective, but um, yeah, please delete Slack. Um, so, the, so that's all very well and good. So I would implore you to start removing network uh, tools from your life and start really looking at the day-to-day -day work you're doing and, and asking yourself, is this actually effective? Is this actually moving me forward? So with that in mind, how can we achieve perfect uh, technical SEO? Who's ever went into work on a Monday and a bunch of stuff's been broken on their website? One person, two people, <laughs> okay. So when I deal with my clients, so I, I'll give you a quick little anecdote. So one of my clients' URLs is domain name slash brand slash brand name. And in their infinite wisdom, one of their juniors decided to change brand to brands plural, which is correct from a grammatical point of view. But what that does, is it completely de-indexed every single brand and every single product on their site. So all the traffic they were getting is now hitting a 404 page. Now, I would not have known that, um, or the client would be phoning me like, um, we're losing tons and tons of money, what's going on? So what I'd recommend is you lock everything down. So the first thing I'd recommend is look at Little Warden. Little Warden is something um, you can get relatively cost effectively and their tagline is amazing. It's monitoring the tedious, um, which I think is great. It looks at if your SSL certificate is about to expire. It looks at if your canonicals are, are going awry. Just all the basic boring stuff that you're never going to check on a day-to-day -day basis. But if you don't check it, you could be in, in real bother. This is my new favorite tool of all time, Content King. Um, it crawls your site on a daily basis, but um, it doesn't actually give you any kind of technical output. It just tells you what's changed. So if someone on your website, let's say you've got some juniors who are putting some content on and they've just randomly decided to change a page, you would never know about that until you run this. And it says literally like every title that changes, every external link that changes, lock it down so you can see cause and effect. Now, as is an agency, the client has got a living, breathing website and it's their right to change it. But when they come to me and say, have our rankings moved? Maybe they've moved up, maybe they've moved down. If I can see what we're doing, but also what they're doing, it gives us a lot more insight into what's going on. Please run periodic crawls. Does anyone here use SEM Rush? Good. One of the best tools uh, in the world for this sort of stuff. Um, if you've got a larger site, 20,000 URLs plus, I would recommend something like Deep Crawl, because um, it's a little bit more robust when it comes to crawling. So ultimately, I would implore you to fix broken stuff right now. Um, I think for as a show of hands, like website owners, 3,000 URLs and below, show of hands. 3,000 URLs and above. Interesting. 5,000 URLs and above? 10. 20? Uh, oh, OK. 100? <laughs> Craig, of course, Craig. Yeah, nice one. Um, so when it comes to a site that's between three and 5,000 URLs, there's really no excuse not to have it like extremely clean, what I call hygiene when it comes to search. So I'm going to go over how you can fix all of this broken stuff pretty much immediately with just a little bit of automation. I'm going to talk about 404s, 
orphan pages and anything that's not in the index. I'm not going to tell you what those things are. I'm going to assume that you already know what it is, so I'm not going to teach you how to uh, suck eggs. I'm just going to tell you how to uh, fix them. So first and foremost, if you download this deck, this particular URL will take you to archive.org. Has everyone used archive.org before? Yeah. So usually archive.org is for people looking to reanimate old websites, but if you go to click that link, that will take you to every single URL of yours that's ever existed over the last 20 years on your website, which is quite nice because you only see usually little snapshots month to month. Download that, go to your analytics, filter by pages, download that again since the beginning of time, since you put analytics on your site. Same with Search Console, pull all of those URLs, then go to Majestic or Ahrefs, pull all of those in as well. And now you've got every URL that's literally ever existed on your website. And what we want to do is go and get that crawled. Um, stick it into something like Screaming Frog, crawl it in list mode, and you'll find everything that's 404ing. And then you can move those 404s into some like better pages in the site. Usually when we're doing any sort of cleanup, the first thing you do is go to Search Console, see what's there, and redirect it in. But for most kind of small businesses, it's kind of interesting that they'll change their website every 18 to 24 months and therefore break the vast majority of their URLs. So very, very important to have a look at the archive in particular. Um, that's a lot of work, and this is where the embarrassing slash Brighton thing, just pretend that says slash Cambridge. We, we've got uh, free Google Sheets. Um, if you want to do that, just dump it in there. It'll take you about an hour to just dump all that information in there. Any developers in at all? That's for you. Python script uh, that will do it in about literally 60 seconds. Um, really easy to use. All right. Orphans and weak pages. Now, I've got a picture of a champagne pyramid next to the word orphans. It's not because I'm a horrible person, um, but it's to illustrate that um, the way internal linking works. So has anyone ever seen a champagne pyramid? You don't bet on the Grand National, but you all know what champagne pyramids are. I'm getting, I'm getting like a really good idea of the, the crowd. Um, so when you pour the champagne in at the top, if I was to remove one of those glasses, that technically orphans that glass orphan page from the champagne. So it's physically impossible for any champagne to go in there, right? It's the same with link equity coming into your home page and being dispersed through your website. So the more glasses that are in there, the easier it is to come down. So internal linking in orphan pages are very important because you've got a page that isn't linked to from anywhere, that's not going to rank. And if it's a main commercial page, that's a serious problem. Um, so all we want to do with this is just release pockets of power inside the site. And the way we do that, first and foremost, take all your main commercial keywords and map them to individual URLs. So for example, let's say you sell uh, lights and light bulbs or lampshades. You would go to your lampshades page and you would map that to the keyword lampshades. And then you would go through all of your main commercial pages and map them together. Once you do that, you want to do a site command. So site domain.com keywords. So in this instance, we've used Brighton SEO, but we'll just pretend this is optimize.com the best SEO site out there. Um, so if we were to do a site optimize.com and the keyword would be venue or the keyword would be conference, um, what that's going to show us in Google is all of the optimize pages that Google thinks are A, most powerful, and B, most semantically related to the keyword we've asked for. What I now want to do is I want to go to every single one of these pages and check, does that have an internal link to my main commercial page? If it doesn't, that's a problem because Google thinks these are the most related and the most powerful to your main commercial page and you're not linking to them. So that's the first thing you need to do. Now, that can be quite difficult to do manually. Screaming Frog users? Couple? Uh, Screaming Frog is super cheap, so I would uh, recommend that you download that. Um, go into Screaming Frog, use custom search. Um, they have a list mode, which you can just crawl a full list of URLs. And then what you want to do is, uh, th this particular thing here is custom search. So you put the, the URL that you want to link up to and run all of your Google URLs through that. And if it's got an occurrence that's more than one, that means that it does not have an internal link pointing to it. So you want to go into that particular page and add an internal link. Super simple. Um, if you want to do that instead of one page at a time, you can do several pages at a time, something called Scrapebox. Has anyone ever used Scrapebox in here? Definitely a black cat? Uh, old school. <laughs> I'm probably still got an active license, but yeah. Okay, brilliant. Um, so, we don't, so this used to be used for uh, blog comment spamming back in the day. We, of course, do not use it for that. We use it for pulling information in, not pushing information out. So with this, you, all you can do, instead of going to Google and doing site command URL plus keyword, you can just put a ton of them in there, 
and this is the output from Google. So you can do that at scale and at bulk, so you can do your entire website in one kind of easy throw. Or you can just use our sheet. It'll take about, to be fair, it takes about four hours with our sheet. Like this internal linking bit is very kind of challenging, very difficult. Or again, for the developers in the room, you can use our internal tool. It's going to be public in the next two weeks with a nice front end on it. So we'll, we'll send you an email whenever it goes live. Next big bit is content gaps. Does anyone here work in content at all or, or, or is it responsible for blogging things? Yeah? Okay. So when I say content gaps, all I really care about is I want to see all the things that I found in my keyword research but are not on my site. I want to see all the things that my customers want to buy from me but I'm not putting in front of them and I'm not getting traffic for. So th this is how we do it. Who here has ever used AdWords to do keyword research? It's slow. I'm not going to do the puns, don't worry. <laughs> um, so we kind of do keyword research, but we kind of don't. So what's keyword research? Ultimately, is like list of keywords with the volumes, right? So you're like, this keyword has this amount of search volume, which tells you a little bit, but it doesn't really tell you the commercial intent of what's going on. So when we do this sort of stuff, ideally what we want to do is group them into big topics, first and foremost. I want to see how much money you're going to make out of each of these topics if we decide to go for it. And I want to see how difficult it is. So what we do is we look at, add up all the keywords we've got here to understand the entire marketplace search volumes. This particular client sells sofas. There's about 11 million searches for sofas in the UK every month. Great. Um, we then try and understand the clicks to their website. We go to Search Console, and then we just look, we remove their brand name, and we look at their average click-through rate, apply that to this, put their average order value in there, and then really easy uh, kind of linear math, we just add it all together. We model a bunch of different conversion rates, 0.5% being terrible, 1% being a bit normal. Does anyone have a 2% conversion rate in here or higher? Higher this man and that man as well. <laughs> That's, that is phenomenal. Um, and then we give them a high, medium, low in terms of the amount of revenue that that particular bit of the marketplace could drive. And from there, we can start understanding if it's actually worth pursuing it. We then plot in an axis to say, show me the volume, so the, the physical demand versus a competition. Um, similar to like a Boston matrix, have you ever kind of seen that? So you really want to be uh, high into the left. So you can see in furniture, this is a bad business to be in because high into the left means that there's actually nothing that's high demand and easy to rank for. But as we can uh, go through it, we can see that things like uh, deck chairs and things like that are a little bit easier to rank for. So we'd have a conversation with the client and say, what's your margins on things like deck chairs? Because they're easier to rank for and there's good margin for it. So we're having a commercial conversation. We're not having a, there's 3 million people who look for sofas. Let's optimize for sofas. Uh, gaps in seasonality, we're going to go on to in a second. I want to first tell you about my secret weapon, which is using the SEMrush API uh, with something called Supermetrics, which is something that takes all the SEMrush information and sticks it into Google Sheets. And this is how we do our keyword research and our gap analysis. So literally, all using this SEMrush tool, go to your main nav, drop all the keywords in there, and then put some negatives in there. Again, I'll give you this sheet afterwards if you want to play with it yourself. Um, press the magic SEM rush button and it pulls in every single related keyword and every single phrase match keyword for that particular query, which this kind of starts to look like keyword research everyone's used to, like just big unusable blocks of information and research. Um, so it tells you everything, all the furniture and all the sofas and all that good stuff. So you get a big data dump. Um, we then want to kind of tag that up. So of all these keywords that SEMrush tells me exists for three-seater sofas, two-seater sofas, uh, chairs and bean bags and all that sort of stuff. I want to categorize it as top level categories so I can start moving it around. So we do that here. And then we want to cross reference it. This is perhaps the most important thing. So you can do this in a really easy way. So go to Search Console using Supermetrics. Look in your keyword research, take the keyword, find it in Search Console, and say, OK, Search Console, if this keyword exists, show me the URL that's ranking for it. And a lot of times you'll see things like no landing page comes up. And I've had to blank this because it's actual client information, but the home page will come up a lot. So I don't know if you've ever looked at your rankings recently, but especially for e-commerce, a lot of times the home page ranks. To me, that's a negative signal and you want to create a landing page for that. So being able to really quickly crosswalk this and understand, A, what's most commercially relevant? When should I be actually optimizing for this stuff? And do I need a page for it? And we can literally do this by clicking a bunch of buttons. Like we, we could literally sit and do this right now. It would take us about 20, 30 minutes. 
and you can get all that stuff at e.agency slash brain. So I've just hit my 20 minute mark, that's what that was, so I'm gonna get go really fast. Um, I'm an ideologue when it comes to link building. Does anyone here do link building or PR or anything like that? Okay, a couple of people, that's interesting. Um, the way I think of links, so usually I'll have a friend come to me and say, Ross, I can get domain authority 10 links, tons of them, absolutely tons of them, I can get 10 of them if you want. Surely that's the same as getting one feature on the BBC. Mm -hmm. Right, well, it would be if it was a linear scale, as in one is one is one is one, but it's not, it's a logarithmic scale. So actually the BBC on this graph would be physically off the scale. So we only go for high-end PR because we're kind of ideologues with that. This is what this looks like to me. So I look at something called algorithmic risk versus flop risk. So algorithmic risk is the risk, if Google finds it, it will either it'll take some sort of punitive measure onto your site, either by penalizing you or just um, removing the value of the links, therefore dropping your rankings. Flop risk is a risk of it not working. So PBNs have got zero flop risk because you own, does everyone know what a PBN is first and foremost? It's a public blog network. It's a, it's a bunch of websites that you physically own that Google doesn't know that you own, so you can use it to artificially link everything. Um, so a PBN is low flop risk because you own it and you can put any link on you want. Getting a link in the BBC is extremely high flop risk because all we're going to do is create a bunch of stories, pitch them to journalists, and they either like them or they don't like them. This is our kind of mix of that sort of outreach. So we'll do about 70, 20, 10. Coca-Cola use it for their kind of content marketing. 70% will go on regionals and nationals, 20% on niche publications, just putting things out in the wires, and then we'll, we'll kind of bulk it up with some blogger outreach and stuff like that, so about 10% of our world is that. The reason Trump is the, on this picture uh, is because you're all familiar with the term fake news. So the idea of fake news, we, we don't create fake news, but we kind of manufacture the news, if you like. So the idea is you just take one interesting data point over here, one interesting data point over there, put them together, then sell in that story. Um, some of the things that we've kind of learned, so we don't actually pitch in to get the link immediately, we pitch in to get the brand mention. So we recently got this place for in the, uh, the BBC, and we just want them to get the brand in there, which is very traditional PR, not very SEO. The reason we want to do that is because when we go to reclaim the link, we don't talk to the journalist to get it added, we talk to the IT manager and copy the journalist then. The journalist isn't usually very good at going into the CMS and changing links and finding things. With IT manager, that's his entire job. So we do a bunch of reclamation for a bunch of people, and that's always what we do. We actually find the IT and web guy, not the person who's originally wrote the story. Don't make your stories too hot. Uh, we've done this piece on Brexit, which I appreciate is a very hot topic. Um, because we've got a bunch of local uh, newspapers as clients, the BBC give them a bunch of data just because they used to steal all their information over the last kind of 20, 30 years. So we got all these kind of research pieces from the BBC, which we can use in all of our outreach. Um, and one of the particular pieces was about Brexit, and it was about uh, foreign nationals in the NHS, uh, sorry, foreign nationals leaving the NHS because of Brexit, which if you looked at the BBC's graph over six months was absolutely categorically correct. But if you looked at over a year, it was also correct. If you looked at over three years, it was still correct. If you looked at over six years, it was still correct. So regard Brexit had no change to foreign nationals leaving the NHS because Brexit didn't happen six years ago. It's only been a recent phenomenon. So the BBC's angle of this is happening and driving foreign nationals away was absolutely correct. But when you zoom, like any piece of data, when you zoom out, it actually wasn't the full story. So we pitched that to right-wing media, so Telegraph, Daily Mail, all that good stuff. And the first thing they said, this is for a recruitment client of ours, by the way. The best, best, best answer I've ever got from a journalist, they said, um, am I going to break this and say it's sponsored by your shitty Scottish recruitment website? And I'm like, yes, that's exactly what I want you to do. He's like, right, you want me to break a massive story that's going to affect the entire nation sponsored by your shit client. I'm like, that's exactly what I want you to do. He's like, no, that's not going to. So don't make it too hot. Too hard to verify. I thought this was an absolute banger of a story. So um, you might laugh, meet trade journals, mm -hmm. but that's domain authority 80. I mean, I'll take a link off meet trade journals. I mean, they've got things like Baxter's admit meat reduction in free bentos pies. I mean, that's hard thing journalism at its best. Um, so what we looked at was a fintech brand who uh, specialise in giving loans to kind of, kind of small startups like butcher shops. Anyone ever heard of Veganuary in here? Veganuary, yeah, guys, why, why? 
Uh, Veganuary is vegan January, which is essentially like celebrating uh, people not eating meat. So we decided to do a comparison of butcher shops popping up in the high street over time versus the amount of money PETA are spending on above the line advertising. Now, to get that information, we had to use our Python developer to scrape all the data from Companies House, data warehouse it ourselves, then visualize it. Then we had to go to another second-hand database, pull that data warehouse and compare it. We then pitched it into these guys, and they're like, this is amazing. Where did you get all this data from? It's like, oh, we got it from like these 50 sources, and we've done this cool thing, and we put it here, and we put it there. They're like, right, so how long is it going to take me to physically verify that? I'm like, oh, it's totally impossible to verify. He's like, so you could have literally just picked that out of your arse yesterday. I'm like, <laughs> uh, what's one way to look at it? So yeah, don't make it too hard to verify. Because the way that the publishing cycle works is if a journalist who needs to write, what, eight to 10 pieces every single day needs to spend a couple of hours verifying if your bit's right, like, if they get it wrong and they've not verified your story, they can't go to the editor like, oh, the PR must have given me the wrong information. It's like, no, that's 100% your job to get that right. So you need to make sure it's not too hard to, to verify. And ultimately, just come up with stories with decent angles. So gender pay thing was very hot uh, recently, and it can still is. Um, we had an eSports client, and we decided to look at uh, the pay of people who are getting played, to, you know, people who play FIFA for a living. The pay of people who play FIFA for a living on the computer versus actual footballers. And we found out that 80% of uh, top-shelf footballers get paid less than kids playing FIFA. Cool story, right? What's a better story? You look at the Women's Professional Football League of every single professional female football player in the world, and you find that 100% of all professional female football players get paid less than every single guy in his bedroom playing FIFA. That's a story, and that's quite cutting information. So pitched it in to a bunch of people, and the BBC were good enough to take it. It was really easy to verify because it came from the PFA, straight from the horse's mouth. And there you go. That's how you get BBC links. That is everything from me. You can download everything at that URL. Thank you very much.